Staying friends with an ex. Playing the self-blame and shame game. That's what this episode is all about with Lynn. 43 years old, two years with 43-year-old Mike, suffering one heartbreak after another and lots of disappointments in between. Two failed pregnancies, one chosen and one a miscarriage. Lots of misfortune in this difficult relationship, but there were some good things and lots of fun and connection for Lynn and she blames herself for the breakup. That is what is continuing to cause her more grief and more wasted time. In this episode, we go through the blaming and shaming game that we can do that is paying a disservice to ourselves and even to the person with whom the breakup has happened, in this case, Mike. For these two to truly move on, I give Lynn, at the end of this episode, one key element that she is overlooking that will free her from the self-blame and shame. If you have been dealing with a breakup, and even if you've stayed friends or not, this episode and what I relate to Lynn from my objective viewpoint will help you enormously because if you are doing this, you are hurting yourself and keeping yourself from moving on. And in Lynn's case, it's pretty much a necessity. Whether she stays friends with Mike or not, you make the call whether that should happen. In most cases, we don't recommend it, but there are always extenuating circumstances where a friendship can be kept. This one, not so sure. You make that determination by listening closely to this interesting and informative episode. So let's get right to it. I'm so thankful for your advice. I love how intelligent and eloquent you are and still have love and given me some great guidance and direction. And now it's up to me to execute it. I feel a lot better just working through it. I thank you so, so much. I feel like you already are instilling more confidence in me that this is possible. Sick of sacrificing or settling in your romantic life? Welcome to Make Him Wonder with Coach Paula Grooms where women struggling in real relationships ask the expert. Unscripted, unfiltered, understandable coaching conversations to help passionate women succeed in love. Hi there, and welcome to Make Him Wonder. I'm your host, Coach Paula, a dating and relationship coach for women, licensed social worker, and author of the book, Why Won't He Commit? How a Man Decides to Make You the One. I coach you to find a potential Mr. Right, get an ex back, or grow an existing relationship with a man you truly desire, and learn how to inspire his continued interest for the relationship of your dreams, so that you level up to the complete commitment you totally deserve. My guest today is 43-year-old Lynn. Those in the 8020 Wonder Club will remember Lynn from an elite episode where Lynn and I talked about her relationship with now 43-year-old Mike. Lynn's relationship with Mike has been intense and filled with heartbreak. In their first year together, Lynn had two pregnancies, one a miscarriage and one she decided to end. It's been several years since then, and Lynn has struggled to pull away from Mike and completely move on. Lynn has worked hard on her self-concept and made many failed attempts at distancing herself, especially because Mike makes no attempt at hiding his involvements with other women. Lynn comes back on Make Him Wonder today to get my thoughts about moving forward with her life and accepting the space she is in with Mike. Lynn says she's tried no contact for six weeks and failed, and because of that, she feels things are worse than before she tried it. She wants to know if it is ever possible to find romance with another man while continuing a non-romantic interaction with an ex. Welcome back, Lynn. Hi, Paula. I'm so happy to talk to you again because, truth be told, we worked together on this for quite a while. Yes, we did. And I want to hear your experience of that I guess it's been, what, maybe five, six months since our last talk, and what has happened. I want you to catch me up on all of that. Okay, so the last time we talked, we had, you know, said about 
going no contact, and this time we were just going to make sure that we ride it out until we were getting to I get the results that I wanted. Let's talk about that for a second. So two years ago, you were at a place like we talked about here in the intro, that you had had a pretty intense relationship with Mike, and you had one pregnancy where you miscarried, and then another one that you decided to end. We talked about this on the last episode we did with you. You were incredibly vulnerable. I so appreciated that. And I was, truth be told, I was very taken in by your plight and wanted so much for this to work for you. And you did the work. We did the steps, so to speak, of the lure him in approach, I believe, to at least the greatest degree possible for you in your comfort zone. If you could take us back to that time and move through that process and tell me your experience of that and bring us up to date, I think that would be really helpful. So doing all the steps that to lure him in was, it was actually working. Take me back to that time when we first started working together, your struggles with doing it, because I don't think we did it completely then. Yeah, in the beginning, when we first started two years ago, he was very much still like a lot in my life. And I was very much still anxious and filled with anxiety. And so, so it was, I needed the program to like move through that or as much as I could. And because of all the things that we talked about as far as my subconscious issues, my childhood issues, it was very, very difficult for me to to really follow through with, you know, the complete program. You know, I would say, oh, yes, I'll, you know, go into a contact and I won't answer his phone calls. And I didn't even think about when he, when all those things that we talked about, when he called, I picked right up. No pause or anything, no thinking about it or nothing. What you were saying was totally correct. And, and the guidance that you were giving me were great. It was me when your subconscious is just that strong. The issues that you have are just, just that strong. It's really, really hard to, um, how can I say, over overcome that when you're dealing with issues like that, really deep issues. So I, I really feel like you have to, you really have to be in that mindset really deep into that mindset of withdrawing yourself from that situation. And if you're not, the strategies, you know, it's really hard for you to do. And I struggled. What was the hardest part? What was hardest to stick to? And in hindsight, do you know now, not why you didn't stick to it, but what was the outcome and the result of not sticking to it? The hardest part of, of sticking to it was not accepting his phone call or not returning the phone call or not replying. It was very easy when you told me to stop contacting him. I was very much able to do that. But, yeah, I couldn't stop myself from replying or answering to his phone calls or, you know, things of that nature. And the result of me not stopping myself from applying to him was, I just think it made it where he was just, he never got into a anxious state. Maybe one time when I didn't answer the phone. So he just never got into a place where he was uh, probably had to critically think about me and do he really want to lose this. And so that's the result of it, of he never, never got, to a place where I was to be anxious about the situation because I always answered. I mm. never had anything to worry about. I, I think that's truly what the result was. Is it, why it didn't work for me. So what you're saying is that he never had anything you said to worry about. He actually never had anything to wonder about. <laughs> Correct. He definitely didn't have anything to wonder about. Uh-huh. 
And that's what hurts us more than anything. So if you can go back in time and remember how it was, did you consciously know that once you tell a man that you need to go no contact, but that once you do, it's going to affect him and you. It's going to affect him in that, typically speaking, he's going to see enormous change. And that finally, you have made a decision and then you live by it. This is so significant because this is how men operate and what they respect. So it's vital that we kind of speak their language, so to speak. And what happens to them emotionally from that, you need to see as the woman play out. It actually creates an interest and desire in you over again, meaning it pulls on the interest level that was initially there, brings it back, and actually through the no contact, he gets more feelings and then starts to pursue from those feelings. And through the pursuit, he falls more for you. Did you truly understand that at the time is the biggest question? I truly felt like I did understand that. I, you know, that's why I felt like I continued to stay in your program because I really believed in that. Mm -hmm. But I, like we've said many, many times before that my subconscious is so strong. I start the fear of, okay, well, well, what if he really just goes? And that part, the fear was just that much more stronger than what I really knew and felt about that concept that you just explained. Right. So you are aptly describing what it is for all of us, the difference between our conscious knowing and our subconscious impulses and emotional behavior. And I have recollection of our working together on this. And it was clear that you understood consciously that the subconscious was pulling you back to the feeling that your love interest is going to leave you, you're going to be abandoned, you will have been kind of a bad girl, so to speak, and it's your fault, and he will be gone. And this is very typical to happen because that's what's happening for the baby mind, zero to seven. That's what happened to you. Your love interest was taken away. And you, as that little girl, were attempting to make sense of it. And it was programmed, like for all of us, not that you were a victim of your love interest being gone, but that you were the cause of it. So our subconscious is much stronger than our consciousness. And it really is a David and Goliath kind of battle. And I bet you felt that. And the Goliath is uh, the subconscious, much bigger, much stronger, much more powerful. But it's a great analogy because in that story, David uses his brain over his brawn. And that's like using our consciousness and what we know to behave in a way that's going to get the results. So that kind of gives an overview that many new listeners will be confused about. But we're going to go more into what happened for you and the stops and starts. Because I remember you really tried hard. You worked on your programming to a great degree. You were completely aware of it, in my recollection. You did the sleep meditations, the affirmations, the manifestation. What was your biggest challenge, do you think, in sticking with it? My biggest challenge, I would say, probably not, you know, all the, the affirmations, probably not in the sleep meditation. You know, it was just in one ear and not the other. 
I guess you could say. And I was saying these, I was saying the positive affirmations, but in my mind, you know, as soon as I'm done, I'm going back to thinking about the negative things about my situation and all these intrusive thoughts about him. And I mean, they go right back to thinking about the, you know, the worst things, my fears. I don't know if it was a thing of not constantly living in that or um, I don't know what it was that made me where I would do those things all the time. It seemed like the sleep medication, the sleep meditations were working, but then when he called and, you know, as, uh, along with what I was supposed to be doing and not doing, it, it, it would go all out the window. You know, we talked about that even during those times where I was, like, in the program week after week, and I really can't even understand or explain how I just never got over that to just, um, you know, pull through to do what I really needed to do or what I set out to do. Yes, that's your Goliath. Yeah. So bring us up to date now that you tried various versions and I think I'm right, but correct me if I'm wrong, that because we knew this was the Goliath for you and you weren't quite ready to pick up the slingshot and sling the rock, <laughs> so to speak, metaphorically speaking, um, we didn't go full force, whole hog on the no contact until you really knew that you could follow through because you understood from being in the program, hearing other women doing it, that the follow through is everything. Yes. So we waited. <laughs> we waited and we did more harm reduction in terms of this. We took the approach of, all right, let's start with you not reaching out. And I recall more of a struggle with that initially, but you did overcome that. You stopped it. You went through the little like troubles with him with it because he didn't like that so much. Right. But you did it. He struggled a lot. He goaded you into reaching out to him like you had been. Do you remember that? Yes, uh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. And you did that, and you saw what outcome from that. So when I stopped reaching out to him, the outcome that I got was more of him coming forward, not in the way that I'd, I'd like, but he was definitely coming forward. But, yes, at the same time, him coming forward was him complaining or, you know, about me not calling him or not reaching out to him. And... um kept him coming towards me. I will say that once you stop, you they really have to have to pivot around to figure out what's wrong with you. And so that's the result of that. When you really stop reaching out, they do have to turn around. And he did to some degree. And because it's a small step, you had lesser results than if you had done it full force and gone full no contact and actually done that. You saw results from it to the degree that we would expect from that action. So we worked forward from there, and y you did well in keeping that going. In other words, you didn't falter back from it. So you really did move the needle. Yes. And I recall from our very last few weeks together, you got to a point of being truly ready and truly doing it because you were going on now year three. Yes. Take us through how you went about finally telling him and sticking to the no contact for six weeks, was it? I mean, yes, it was about six weeks. Okay. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. It all started... December 1st, and he, there was a Christmas party that I invited him to that he told me that oh, I'm probably not going to be able to make it to that. And the reason why that was upsetting was because he didn't ask me the, when was it, the time. 
So it was just like he didn't care because he just straight out just said, I'm not going to be able to make it to that. And then in the same conversation, I said, okay, what about, you know, it's December 1st, we can start making plans for New Year's Eve. And he told me, oh, I'm going out, I, I won't be here in town, I'm going out of town for New Year's Eve. And that made me go into questions like, well, okay, well, who, you know, who you're going with New Year's Eve is like a couple type thing in my mind and like who you're going with and he pushed back never did tell me that he was going with another woman but he just like you know why am I asking so many questions what are all these questions about which made me assume that it had to be oh if it wasn't about another woman then it wouldn't have been a big deal I just don't imagine it being a problem me asking a question about who you're going with if it wasn't about another female So he never admitted to that. So after that conversation, that was December 1st, that was on a Friday. I spoke to you the next day on a Saturday, and we both agreed that it was really, really time to, this would be a great time to go full force. And so I did it. January came. I did it. He had called Christmas, didn't answer. He called my mom. She didn't answer. So it was kind of working then. Well, it was actually working. But he never had, he didn't say anything. He didn't have any response to that. He just called, called a couple of times and didn't leave any messages or anything like that. Then after that, you know, he's a guy that was very much into family stuff and family events and things. So a couple of days after Christmas, it was my mom's birthday and we had a celebration out at dinner. And that would be something that he normally would go to. Um, he, you know, reached out on social media and said, why wasn't I invited? He was really kind of feeling it then. Then by New Year's, he didn't reach out anymore to say Happy New Year's or anything because he did wish me happy or Merry Christmas, but I didn't answer. So let me just stop you here for a second. So you had sent some kind of text or email or letter or you had said this is done for me and I'm moving on before all this? happened with Christmas? No. Ah, okay. So you had just started going no contact without any explanation? That is correct. I see. How long did that go on? With no explanation? Right. Um, for the six weeks, for the total of six weeks, and when he reached out on my birthday, which was um, exactly six weeks, then and I re- that's when I responded. And then I, and then when he finally talked to me, maybe like the next day or so, and I told him why at that time, so about six weeks later. I see. Tell us about that conversation when you told him why. What did you say? Well, I told him because we were on the phone, I didn't go exact into the letter, the things that we said in the letter that we crafted, because I felt that because it was kind of, the situation wasn't prime of how we wanted to present that letter. I just gave him kind of a vague type of reason, like, you know, I really was upset about you not really seeming interested about being with me for Christmas time and New Year's. I was just really upset and hurt behind that. And he acted like, you know, he kind of didn't understand that. Um, And, Mm -hmm. you know, he went into kind of defending himself, saying that, oh, I tried to call you back and and, you know, and tell you that I was going to go to your Christmas party with you. And then, you know, and telling me I didn't even go out of town for New Year's Eve. And so he kind of made me feel bad about what I did. Okay. This is a really important point for everyone to hear. And a very good example of it. Also, the reason why it doesn't work well. You see, you used a an event, a situation, and just went no contact. Now, I'm not saying that just going no contact can never work. It can. But the way this played out for you is one of the reasons why it didn't. But using an event and a situation as an explanation will get you nowhere. Here's how he understood what was going on. He doesn't go to the party, and he makes his plans for New Year's with whatever woman or whatever he's going to do, and you stop 
contact. For six weeks, you do that. And he comes back with a lame happy birthday text and you answer. And when I say lame, I want you to understand why that is. You see, through that six weeks, if he were truly suffering from the no contact, if he realized what he had done, if he had any insight into his behavior, vis-a-vis wanting with desire to fix it or get back with you, you would have gotten a lot more than a lame happy birthday that may have even come up on a notification from social media or whatever, meaning Lynn's birthday today. So he does something lame, not, I have missed you so much. I know I made mistakes. I have realized over the past few months how much I miss you and I want to see you. Now, those words are a bit elegant for a man. May not do exactly that, but a version of it. And once you get that, you don't even immediately answer that because you need to see if it's true. Because if it's really true and somebody really feels like that, they will continue. Meaning a man who feels like that will continue to attempt to get your attention. But the salient point here, and those are big ones, but here's the biggest, is that when you gave him the reason you used an event or situation that's a one-off, and he connotes it to, I made a mistake, I dance my little dance after, and then it's going to be all right and okay, because that's what he's used to doing with women. Because in your case, it was not at all about that one missed party, New Year's. All of that was simply the straw that broke the camel's back for you. It's the overall desire, need, relationship, want, the quality of that relationship, his intention, the commitment, and the lack of you being respected as a partner and the big overriding reasons why. Without that, you get no movement in the man. And I assume that's what's occurred. You gave him that reason, he gave you his excuses, or he made up for it in some other way, and then you started interacting again. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So what did you show him from accepting interaction back? Mm, I showed him that I'm easily, I guess, won over. I would say I guess I'm not even really thinking... I don't really care about the bigger picture, basically. I don't really care about the bigger picture, just small things. Small, oh, you missed a party. Oh, you didn't take, you know, you you going out of town for New Year's without me. It's just small things instead of the really big picture. Yes, you put it perfectly. Uh-huh. That's exactly what happened. So tell me from there, and now we're kind of current because it's been about No, the six weeks were how far back? So so bring us up to date from that call to now. So that call was about six months ago. And since then, we have been um, just communicating here and there. Definitely not like how it was before I attempted that. It was a little bit more communication and a little bit more interacting with each other. So now, you know, I still follow those things that we talked about as far as definitely not reaching out. And so that still, he keeps, he continues to to call. He continues to complain about, um, he does all the reaching out and, um, and, you know, but, and now since some time has passed, I guess he feels more comfortable now coming around. So he's came around to just do some, you know, help me out a little bit as far as like my car and things of that nature. And so, yeah, like he came over yesterday and he fixed something on my car for me. And, you know, because I've gotten to this point where I just kind of accept 
where we're at, I don't feel those anxious feelings about him quite intensely like that anymore. And, and you know, I think he just finds little reasons to to see me, but that's as far as it, that's as far as it goes. So, how would you categorize the relationship so that we're really clear on it? Is it friends with benefits? It's just friends. Um. It was friends with benefits, but not in a romantic type of way. Like we haven't had any kind of romantic encounter since last year, like say about eight months ago. So I want to be really clear because the definitions are kind of important. Friends with benefits implies that you have a sexual relationship with no thought, certainly on the man's side, that there is anything more and you're fine with that. Is that what it is or it's something else? No, it's not what it is. If if that's the case, then we're just just friends. Okay. What made you think it was friends with benefits before we talked about that? What made me think it was friends with benefits because I still can call him and ask him to do things for me. Like like I said, I I had him come over to fix my car yesterday, and he did it. And Mm -hmm. so... I'm thinking, well, that's a benefit of having him as my friend is to do things that I can't do, you know, with cars or whatever. So that's the the benefit part. I gotcha. Okay. So that is what we term a friend because you'd help him do something probably too if he needed. Yes. Okay. But you are here because... There's something lingering with you whereby you are not okay with the just friends. Is that true? Yeah, I I go back and forth with the lingering feelings of just being friends and being okay with just being friends. Because sometimes I think about the real big picture about the things about him, which I've always thought about is this a person that I really want to be do I really want yes want but do I really need to be in a relationship with and so those thoughts make it easy to kind of just be friends because you know I've been because I've had some time to really think about what I really really want and the things that come with Mike and his situation are just not really what I really need in my life as far as as a partner. So there are a couple questions that can help you get to making a decision about how you have him in your life, if you have him in your life at all. So first and foremost, I want to ask you the question, are you ready to make some kind of decision? And I'm not telling you in any way or directing you towards any of the decisions because there are myriad ways you can have him in your life, what you need to know is how he sees it right now. And that's what I'm going to give you so that you can help yourself make a decision out of how he's seeing it. Does that help if you knew how he's kind of looking at it? Yes, that would help. Okay. So this is what I believe from having worked with you and knowing a bit about him in the way that I do is that he loves being in your life, in your mom's life, and the kind of almost family feeling he gets because of it. And there's a part of him, perhaps, and I mean a very small part, if at all, because I'm not so sure it's there. I'm just saying it's very small, that thinks that maybe one day you will have something more when he's decided maybe that he's done with other women. I would give that a one to five percent chance. And the reason why I say that, and I know that's hard to hear, is because he's given no indication, certainly in the last couple of years. Not only is he not ready, he's not capable of it, and he certainly isn't willing. This, I think, is part and parcel of his own self-concept has led him to be struggling in his career life and the lack of feeling worthy underneath of being that man for you doesn't allow him to be. Does that compute or ring true for you at all? Yes. 
I, I agree with that. Okay. So you may think, well, why does he come and do things for me? And what does he get out of just texting me every once in a while or calling me? And maybe you even have like pseudo flirtations, do you? Mm, no, I would say no. Everything is kind of like surface. And, you know, we just like yesterday, we kind of joke like we've always joked, but it's not in like a, a sexual kind of way, not in like a flirtatious type of way, but Okay. Not in my eyes. I don't, I don't, I don't see it as a flirtatious. It's just how we kind of like laugh and joke together. But it might be a flirtatious type of way to somebody else. Okay, so it has morphed into truly just friends, and he knows via your actions. I'm not saying it's true, but he knows via your actions that you're okay with it. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. From the introduction you had mentioned that something about, is this keeping you from moving forward with other men? And if so, what do you do about it? Generally speaking, is that true? Yes. Okay. Again, we get down to the decision, and I'm not so sure you've truly made one in a very deep way. And what I mean by that is that the friendship may be confusing, not to your consciousness, but to your subconscious, likely. What do you think about that? I never thought of it. I haven't thought of it like that. I think it'd be more confusing like you, like when it was before, when we were still sleeping together. That was confusing. But because we don't have any romantic encounters, it's more, it's not so confusing. Okay, that's good. So, if you could give me a percentage, what percentage would you give it if I asked you to what degree is your relationship as friends holding you back from moving on romantically with someone else? And I want you to really think about that. And I want to find out what that percentage is in a moment. I trust you're enjoying Make Him Wonder and that you're getting a lot of helpful information for the life of love you desire and deserve. So if you're not part of the 80-20 Wonder Club yet, you need to be, because now Make Him Wonder is exclusive, a members-only club to listen to every episode, past, present, and future, in full, all ad-free. The 80-20 Wonder Club is a Make Him Wonder membership that gives you all of seasons one, two, and three in a categorized list by age and relationship status and a multimedia library of my content, including my book, relationship evals, and my Mechanics of Men Mindset Manual, a weekly action step you can focus on to attract and keep the man of your dreams and have him committing to you completely in the coming months. Make this the moment you start living as an 80-20 Wonder Woman, because love, like life, is best lived in 80-20. When you do 80% of what works with men, the 20% you don't won't much matter. Join the 80-20 Wonder Club by going to the 8020wonder.club. Don't miss out. Go now to the 8020wonder.club. You and your man will be glad you did. So in thinking about that question, Lynn, what percentage would you give it whereby you feel, whether that's 100%, 50, 2, whatever, that being friends with him in this non-romantic way is holding you back from moving on, pursuing, even thinking about having a romantic relationship with someone else? I'd say 20%. Okay. What makes you feel it's 20% and not 100 or zero? Um, I would say 20% is because, I can be honest, that I, I still love him. And I just haven't got to the point where I'm, I would say I'm 100% over it. I'm accepting our situation, but am I over the whole thing? Not yet. So a part of me wishes that it could have, you know, turned around. And still, even at this point, I wish it was a point that it could have turned around. So, but you know, like I said before, I kind of stop myself sometimes just to think about the reasons why it's probably not the best 
for me to even try to manifest that because of the things that I know about him. But my feelings and what I, how I, you know, how I feel about him and stuff like that, that part is just like, I think about that a lot. Interesting. Tell me what you mean you think about it a lot. I think about every day about, you know, how I wish I was a bit stronger to have fully, when the times when I, he was actually like, um, when I actually kind of really wasn't even in the no contact, but I have, you know, and I wasn't answering his phone calls and he was really, really calling and trying to find out what was going on. And so I always think about my mistakes, like why, though, you know, it just kind of just hits me sometimes, like even that moment would have been a good moment. And, and so I, it makes me always think about my mistakes and how if I could have just been so much stronger than how my situation probably could have been so much better. You know, so it kind of feels like a loss, like I lost in this game. So that part keeps me thinking, even though, yeah, I could move on and, and find someone else, and I'm actively looking for that, but I still feel like I lost. I understand. That's very common. The reasons why this is occurring for you are really twofold in my book. The first is that this is living out your deepest programming of what love is. Not the outer world tangible stuff of what's actually going on with him, but your inner world of chastising yourself for not doing it right. And that's your conscious part. (laughs) The subconscious is not being enough. I think your Mm, says it all. You get it. Yeah, I do. You see, with your situation from birth to age seven, and we don't have to go into it, I know it, you were doing this, meaning in your mind, you were attempting to be who you felt you should be to be loved in a way that would more get your needs met and make you feel like you matter. Yeah. And you can take what's happening to you now as the adult, conscious, intelligent being that you are, take what's happening to you with those thoughts and now attempt, because it's almost impossible for us to even conceive of it, but attempt to take those to a level whereby your entire being knows that you need to get that love for survival. What I mean by this is that you take those conscious thoughts and feelings you have now related to, if only you'd done it differently, you made the mistakes, you messed up, all the awful feelings that you have. The reason why you have them is that this is your experience of love. You experienced all of this from birth to age seven at your deepest hardwiring when you were being programmed to be an emotional person, to be the person you are. And it's like those feelings you have now on steroids. So it's not at all surprising that you would need this relationship to continue Wow. It sounds like that makes sense to you. Yes, it does. I didn't think of it as I need this to continue. Mm -hmm. And here's the remedy. If you free yourself of it, and I'm not even saying you need to free yourself of the little friendship that you have, even. It's not that that is the issue. In other words, that seems to bring some niceties or pleasantries or certainly help to your life. It's not altogether negative at all. He values you enough and your relationship, what you built together, stuff with your mom, to come and help whenever he can. Yeah, I, I, yes, he does. And just, just to insert here, you know, this, like yesterday, he came and helped me with my car. It's little things I don't, still don't understand about 
I had told him about my car a week ago or so, but then, you know, I said, mm, I'm not going to remind him about it. I'm just going to take care of it myself. So I didn't never, like I said, I don't reach out to him anyway, but he knew about this, but he reached out to me to like remind me that he needs to fix this. And I feel like, I, you know, I sometimes I didn't, still don't understand. If we're just friends. Like, why is that? Like, you know, if I took care of it or, you know, why is that still on his mind? Why would that, like, he would actually remember something now to help me? I can tell you. He has programming like you do. And when I say like, I mean, everybody has programming. It's not similar. He just has programming too. And his is that he is not enough and will lose love from not doing something of service mm. to prove his worth, so to speak, to his love interest. It's very deep, though, for him. And as a man, the worth component of it is very deep. And he does not feel worthy in that he can't provide anything for you. He can't be the man you need in a relationship. But he truly loves you and he does need this relationship as much as you do. Wow, Paula. That's pretty profound. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So when you say that it's holding you back 20%, in terms of finding something else, when you say what you just said to me about him and that being profound, it's now what are you going to do about that? Because his programming and where he is in his life, the chance of him moving forward with anything that you want and that will provide lasting happiness for you is much lower in my book than 20%. I mean, much lower. So you feel that, you saying it's much lower for him to move on? Is that what you're saying? No. He's not ready, willing, or able to give you a full relationship that you desire. It's much less than a 20% chance that you would ever get that with him. Oh, yes. Okay. I think you know this. You've lived it. But you're both caught with your programming, which we all are. You must make a decision whether or not this is enough. I don't think you'd be on this call if it was. I would hope at your age you would not accept having a friend who has shown an inability for you to move on. Here's what I mean. I assume the two of you don't talk about your dating. No, we don't. What do you think he knows about yours? Hmm. He doesn't know probably anything. I don't think he's on any dating app. I don't think he's, I don't think he's seen me on any dating app. Uh, that would be about the most he would know because I've never spoke to him about it. If he is, if he's ever seen me on one, so I'm not really sure what he knows. Here's what I believe is going on and what will occur. As long as it's a don't ask, don't tell, you're going to be fine. But the moment he believes there's another man in the picture, it's going to trigger him of the loss that he could potentially sustain. This is confusing to you, perhaps, because it will be, well, you didn't want me that way. This makes no sense. All right. But if you understand, you will be somewhat triggered if he finds someone else, correct? Uh, well, yeah. I mean, I feel like he kind of has already. So ah. even though he doesn't talk about it, but it's like, it's still kind of confusing because I feel like if you, if that is what's going on, I don't understand the, his purpose of trying to making sure you remember things to help me out. And that's the part that's kind of confusing if, since I do feel that he is probably seeing someone else because especially romantically, because we are not so, and haven't been in almost, almost a year now. Um, so, okay. So understand that 
he doesn't want a relationship heading towards full commitment, monogamy, just that one person and riding off into the sunset and forever and marriage and kids. Not ready, not willing, not able at this moment. Would you say that's true? I would say that's true. You're connoting that it's you that's the issue for him about it. It's not you. If he were ready, willing, and able, I don't have any doubt that it would be you he would choose. He's not choosing those other women for that at all. They're fun buddies. They may think they have some kind of relationship with him. He's not cultivating that necessarily with anybody else. He's not looking for that. He gets the familial stuff and fulfillment of being a part of something and loved, because he knows you love him. He gets that from you and then can have sex with different women or do whatever he's doing, playing around with others. And he can still feel good about himself and not alone in the world. It's a version of Madonna whore. One could say that it's total Madonna whore. He just doesn't even have that romantic thing with you in any way, the sex, nothing. But it's still that for him. One could even say that's Madonna whore on steroids because the good girl and the one whose love is shown, who's a respectable woman, you don't want to have sex with. Mm. But it's going to be very interesting for you to see if you continue this friendship. And I'm not suggesting that you can't, but you've got to put very serious boundaries on it. But when he gets wind of it, like, for example, if there's some post that comes his way when you were serious about somebody, because I'm not about you posting any picture with any man who's not your fiancé or your husband. Yeah, I wonder if percent have made a decision on on that you know when we were seeing each other i did post pictures about him and he was about the only well no anywho i've made a decision not to ever post another man on my social media unless we were engaged or so yes good but if you are at a party and you're in a group and you're sitting next to a man and it looks a little too close or something like that you could get questions see him get a little jealous, etc. So you're at a point of not making a decision necessarily whether he's in your life or not, but to be working on yourself and getting to a place, truly knowing and being mindful of whether or not you can continue to do this. And what I'm hearing is that it's not allowing you to truly move on as evidenced by the thoughts that you are having and how it is pulling on your subconscious because he is in your reality. That's correct. So that's where your decision lies. Because if you don't create those boundaries, you are perpetuating your subconscious experience of love. And it's going to feel, believe it or not, needed, like that pain, like those thoughts, like at least it's something. In other words, if you could put yourself in a position of, okay, I no longer have any of those thoughts, any of those feelings. It's like I wiped my emotional slate clean in a sense. That, in a way, will produce anxiety because it's like if I plucked you from where you are right now and stuck you on another planet with aliens. It's like you would have no experience of it and it would be awful. Mm. Does that make sense at all? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. In other words, you need that. You need those thoughts. It's like you have love. It's your experience of love. So that's why it's been so tough to get out of this, even though your consciousness knows this isn't what it's supposed to be. Mm. <laughs> right? Yes, yeah, that's true. 
I do feel like I use this, what's going on now, as a crutch. I'm like, okay, uh, I'm okay. You know, I don't have these anxious. I don't, I, yes, I have thoughts, but I don't feel anxious and depressed like I was feeling before. And so I say, okay, this is, I can deal with this. And when I eventually meet someone else, then those, the, the last little parts, those thoughts will just kind of go away. But because I'm not meeting, I haven't met anyone yet that I really like yet or that I've been seeing or dating on a consistent basis yet, um, I still just have those lingering thoughts. Mm -hmm. So it begs the question, what are you doing to move your life forward in this way? Direct your attention at every moment away from Mike. That's super hard. In other words, it takes a lot of intention to do it and stick to it, develop the habit of doing it, and not let yourself slip back and get away with not doing it. That's what I mean. I'm not hearing that you can't. And knowing your situation, at this juncture, I would not say you have to completely get him out of your life, that is going to cause you enormous anxiety. He has been a friend. And I think the berating yourself for the mistakes is that you feel that the time has passed for it to ever work, for this approach to ever work. In other words, it's gone too far. You're now friends. Is that right? That's exactly how I feel. It's gone too far and went too long and it's almost impossible to reverse it back to him having this deep desire of love for me or to be romantic with me. And here's why I'm so happy you are on today. Because if you take nothing else from our talk, I mean nothing else, and you hear this and you start to know it like you know your name, you will start to free yourself of this. Because I worked with you, as we did, I know this. I, I know it to my deepest core. The only thing I have hope for is that sometime in the distant future, for Mike, it changes. And when I say distant future, I don't know if that's even possible. And here's what it is. Wondering about the one thing I'm going to tell Lynn she needs to know that will free her from the anxiety and intrusive thoughts she has about Mike? In the rest of this episode, I outline for Lynn my objective opinion of her situation that will help Lynn to shift her focus and move on from self-blame as well as what it is that I hope for for Mike. And because I want you to get the results you desire with your current or future Mr. Right, I invite you to check out the 8020 Wonder Club, where you can hear the rest of this episode with Lynn, where I give her the elixir that will allow her to free herself from anxiety, doubt, and self-blame. The 8020 Wonder Club is an exclusive membership-only club of the Make Him Wonder podcast where you'll get nearly 200 ad-free episodes categorized by age and relationship status, plus all new episodes the moment they're formatted and ready to be aired. Unfiltered coaching conversations like this one, with all my advice and principles to have you succeeding in your romantic life. But there's much more. The 8020 Wonder Club includes my Making Magic with Men Mindset Manual, a weekly video series of mindset and mechanics practices for you to do at your own pace. It alone is valued at over $500 and is all yours as a member. Join monthly and cancel at any time or save by committing to a 6 or 12 month membership. And not only will you save by committing to more, you'll receive a full coaching intensive experience where you'll be talking to me in a conversation like you just heard. You choose the date anytime during your 12 month membership and I'll be answering all your questions on getting what you desire and deserve. Check it out at the 8020wonder.club and join us as that is the only way you'll be able to hear what I tell Lynn that is vital for her to move forward freely and much, much, much more easily. 
Don't miss out on how to make your man wonder in the right way to have divine right results in your romantic life. Go now to the 80 wonder dot C-L-U-B. That's the 8020wonder.club. You and your love will be glad you did.